Varnata, uh, what should I do? Is there a necessary for, for providing instructions or starting with instruction? Sriram, excuse me. Sriram. Uh, before that, we have a practice of declaring the previous day's uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Is it ready to declare? Yes, uh, Bharat yes, sir. is joined with us. Yes, Bharat, yes, is yes. it all set? Yes, absolutely. Okay, okay, Bharat, Bharat. Okay, Bharat. Please and, Thank you so okay. much. It is already 3 p.m. So uh, I would not like to take too much time in announcing the results. And uh, as always, it is my honor to be announcing the results of UL Space Quiz 21. As you know, after each and every Saturday webinar, we have a special quiz which is conducted over Google Forms. Uh, the questions are based on what you will learn today and some general questions on the topic of discussion. This is not mandatory. Anybody who is interested, any student who is interested in participating in the quiz may click on the Google Form link, which will be provided towards the end of today's webinar. And uh, if you attend it, the person with the most uh, highest marks and also with the fastest time of submission will be selected and the first three will be uh, receiving their own certificates with the first person receiving a cash prize which is sponsored by Sindhabe Nurture. So here are the results of UL Space Quiz 21. And uh, as always, let's go with the conventional way of starting from the third to the first. So the third prize has been backed by Arsana TM, who is a ninth standard student at GVHSS Nair Kuri. Congratulations. The second prize has been backed by Advait PK, and he's an 11th standard student from GVHSS Madapalli. Congratulations, Advait. And the first prize winner, who has been an active participant of our previous quizzes as well, and he is Eldo Sam Burgis, who is an 11th standard student from GVHSS Madapalli. Congratulations to all winners and all participants, and best of luck to today's quiz as well. Over to Sriram for the introduction session. Okay, Bharat, am I audible? Absolutely. Okay, first of all, I like to give you important instructions regarding to the webinar, which is already uh, given by Varanatan. I will repeat it. Switch off your mics and uh, cameras until you have to express something to us or till we request you to say something. And most predominantly, even if you rejoin after leaving the meet, don't press present screen button. Because if you do so, there's a possibility of losing the presentation of the speaker temporarily. And we wish you to pin the presentation screen of speaker by tapping it from selecting uh, from the people list. So it will be easy for you to see the slides of our speaker always. And the chat box is only for asking your questions for the Q&A session. And all kinds of discussions using chat box are strictly prohibited due to the decision made by webinar committee. Discussions can be done in our WhatsApp group called Cosmos, which is already under the UL Space Club. If you are interested in that, please DM to Varnatan or Bharat. They will provide their numbers in the chat box soon. Uh, so that's all for now. That's the instructions. And Shajil sir, can I move with the introduction? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon to all of you. Thanks to Ranatan and Bharat for providing the instructions and announcing the results of the previous webinar quiz. I cordially invite all the scientists, veterans, teachers, UL Space Club organizers, students, and all other participants to the 22nd session of UL Space Club's webinar series. We, the UL Space Club, is a foundation under the umbrella of Uralanda Labor Cooperative Society, which stands for enriching and flourishing the scientific aptitude of students, especially in space field. Within the three years from starting, we conducted many great offline events that's before COVID. And from the beginning of this pandemic era, we started this new venture called the webinar series, which is going extremely well for these past six months. Today, in the 22nd session, we have Dr. Rajaram Nityananda sir as the lead speaker on the topic, Radio Astronomy, a success story of Indian science. Since the 1930s, when the first radio signals from the space were detected by Carl Janskai, astronomers have used radio telescopes to explore the universe by detecting radio waves emitted by a wide range of objects. Our sun, the nearest star to Earth, is a powerful radio emission source, mainly due to its proximity to our planet. 
but some radio sources which are millions or even billions of light years away are truly colossal in terms of their radio output radio astronomy progressed through the middle of the last century with many great discoveries made in radio frequencies such as the discovery of pulses which eventually become a nobel prize winning thing another notable okay and our speaker today's speaker is also an expert and uh, uh, the one who shared the uh, with the this year's nobel laureates and i think i hope he will share those experience too with us he was the former director of national center for radio astrophysics and currently working as a professor in asim premji university uh, he has highly uh, experience in the field of radio astronomy of course and i, I gladly welcome dr raja ram nityananda sir to the 22nd session of ul space club webinar series and apart from that we have arnayton abhinandan and all core team members here to give you the instructions when it's necessary and the moderator of the session our all in all shajil sir here to control the session and he will give the more informations about our respected speaker our chief mentor ek kutti sir the former chair director of isro is here with us as always jairam sir and the whole webinar family including eminent scientists all over india like uh, our jodi basu sir and the whole members rangrajan sir and all Uh, will be with us in this session ul space club student fellow master bharat srijit will handle the q and a session after the talk and damodaran sir the one who plays the major role in connecting us to ul is here to express the word of thanks after the session our streamer another ul space club student fellow adil krishna is also ready with us so without any further delay i welcome the moderator shajil sir to take over the session or to shajil sir okay thank you sri ram we have been sitting here for the past 20 22 weeks in search of science and we are the students are showering with the lights of science for the past few weeks and and uh, and we are exploiting and we are exploring this most adverse situation in the pandemic and we today we have we are happily presenting dr rajaram nityananda from Asim Premji University, and man is ever curious on his search for life and what's the outside the space. And in search of that, we resort to some signals coming from these areas. That is the radio waves that was already mentioned by the uh, uh, Sylvia. And we are in search of the things happening around this uh, universe. and we are learning this we are analyzing these radio waves and what's there and we, we try to detect these things and today we have an expert in this field dr rajaram nityananda and he was part of three major institutes in india one was national center for radio astrophysics and tata institute of fundamental research and center for inter interdisciplinary science hyderabad these are the three science pillars in india and he nurtured the he was a director the and he guided lot of indian science he he helped lot of uh, indian scientists personally working here and abroad and he was a he's an indian physicist who works on solid state physics liquid crystals astronomical objects optics and image processing and gravitational dynamics and he is an editor of a journal of astrophysics and astronomy and he serves as the chief editor of our resonance journal for science education published by indian academy of science and is also a chairman of board of directors national institute of technology tiruchirappalli and chennai mathematical institutes these are the two institutes our students the space club students want to get into and explore the world of science and to contribute to this nation he is currently serving as a faculty member at indian institute of science education and research pune i sir pune and he was part of raman research institute and we welcome these great men of india great scientists of india to our forum of ul space club for the past 22nd uh, 21 weeks we are 
we are receiving the blessings of eminent science of india from various institutes in the field of science space and other areas and we are in search of these science and these around 100 students continuously following this space club who are from different part of india is blessed with these scientists and we are sure that you will guided by these scientists in future also they want to develop you and the asim premji university is so interested in developing these science aspirants of india with special interest that i learned from the chief guest earlier when his personal contact uh, talk with him and we are sure that this great personality this great scientist will guide our real science aspirants in future we here we dedicate this talk to veteran radio astronomer of india dr gobind sarov who passed the who passed away on 7th of september and we dedicate this session for in memory of that great man of india and we make a warm welcome to our forum for this our chief guest and presenter and our most honorable guest dr rajaram nityanand sir welcome sir um uh thank you uh Mr. Rajiv and uh, everyone else who has welcomed me to this uh, forum, I would like to uh, start by saying that uh, after I agreed to give this talk, uh, many interesting events happened, like uh, the award of the Nobel Prize and. Uh, And of course, uh, the passing of Professor Govind Sarup uh, meant that a lot of events have been held in his memory, and I'm very happy that uh, this talk is also being dedicated to him. Uh, if people are more interested, there are uh, resources on the web put up by NCRA. If you go to the website of National Center for Radio Astrophysics, and you will find a lot of material on Professor Govind Sarup. I will be saying something about him, uh, but my main goal. In giving this talk, is uh, first of all to introduce you to radio astronomy. Though you may have already learnt something of it in the popular media, but maybe to go into greater depth. Uh, I truly think that it is one of the branches of astronomy which has made very rapid progress in the 20th century, latter half, which you already heard a little bit. And the second reason is, of course, it is something that I am familiar with. And I should really talk about that. And the third reason is that, of course, uh, there are Indian scientists working in many fields, but uh, sometimes their achievements and their successes are not as well known to our students as they should be. So uh, about half this talk will be on radio astronomy in general, and the latter half will be on uh, the achievements uh, in our country. Which have actually brought it to an international level. Okay. So the summary of my talk is that uh, I've divided the progress of radio astronomy into three parts: yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Right? So yesterday, let's say 1950 to 1960. In that time, it was just a neglected part of astronomy. There were a few very dedicated people. Who were uh, measuring radio waves, and uh, many of them had got trained in the use of radio waves because during the Second World War, they were using radar. As you know, in radar, radio signals are sent out from uh, the source antenna, and they uh, strike a aeroplane or some object and come back, and that way you can detect these objects. Okay, and once the war was over, some of these people. Decided to turn their antennas to the sky, but the first pictures that they made were very crude. Okay, and that's the reason why the rest of astronomers did not take notice. So I have mentioned the word resolution here. That simply means uh, every point in your picture is an average of some region on the sky, and uh, the size of the full moon is about half a degree. So if you had a picture in which the whole full moon was just one point. You may say that's not a very good picture. You are not seeing any details, and that was how radio astronomy started. However, if I take the period 
from 1960 to the present, uh, tremendous changes took place, which I'll be telling you about. Uh, it now studies the universe as a whole, the formation of galaxies, magnetic fields, black holes, which are the subject of the Nobel Prize, which I think we should have a separate talk on that. Okay. So black holes will come up in my talk, but not the Nobel Prize winning work. Okay. The birth and death of stars. And uh, more recently, the regions around stars where planets form. All these have been studied by radio astronomers. And the greatest surprise is that because the wavelength of radio waves is long, uh, this resolution that I told you, the detail of the pictures produced by radio telescopes was very poor. But due to a beautiful technique, which I will be telling you about, the resolution has now improved. So today, radio astronomy, in spite of having the longest wavelength, actually has the best angular resolution. And we will see an example of that. And it's extremely sensitive because of very large radio telescopes which have been built. So uh, since I cannot tell you all about radio astronomy, I have selected four uh, major discoveries which happened after 1960. Okay? And in each case, I'll give you some background. I'll show you a few pictures and move on. So this is a bit like uh, going on a guided tour in a bus. Uh, you know, the guide takes you, shows you something, but before you can see properly, he takes you away to some other place. Okay, but uh, there's plenty of time in the question answer session. If any of you are interested in more details, so around 1950, uh, people uh, had constructed models of the expanding universe, and uh, if it is expanding, it means in the past it was much uh, smaller, which means the density of matter was much more. And then if you compress matter, it will naturally become much harder. Okay. So uh, this model, which is called the Big Bang model, was constructed. Clearly, it's a theoretical model. Uh, and it was constructed for a different reason to explain how we were able to form chemical elements heavier than hydrogen. Okay. So that is the reason for constructing that model. But uh, one of the predictions of that model was that as this universe would also be full of radiation, radiation. just as any hot object emits radiation. But as the universe expands, the radiation cools down. And uh, this famous uh, scientist called George Gamma, whose books are worth reading even today, he said that you will be able to see radiation at a temperature of a few degrees Kelvin. Okay? Then he was completely forgotten. In 1965, without knowing about his work, uh, two astronomers, uh, I've given their names here, Penzias and Wilson. They won the Nobel Prize. It's Wilson. Uh, but interestingly, they were not working in a university. They were working in a telecommunication company called Bell Labs. Uh, many of you may know that Alexander Graham Bell is the person who invented the telephone. He also started a company which did very well, created one of the best telephone systems in the world. And some of this uh, uh, Technology included uh, receiving signals from satellites. Okay, I think you heard a lot about satellites from my friend and colleague uh, Rangarajan, who was a teacher. So this uh, instrument, which they constructed to look at very weak signals from satellites, unexpectedly detected some radiation coming from all directions. And uh, if you assume that the radiation was emitted by a hot body, the temperature was 3 degrees Kelvin. Uh, Kelvin means that it's above absolute zero, so it's extremely cold. So to give an example, liquid helium is at 4.2 degrees Kelvin, very low temperature. So uh, of course, this had to be confirmed by further measurements. And once uh, this was accepted, this really began the modern age of cosmology. because then it was very clear that this Big Bang model was correct. And then people used the model to explain so many other things, like the formation of stars, galaxies, and so on. In fact, one of the Nobel Prizes uh, just two years back, I think, was given to uh, people who worked on the Big Bang model. Okay. One person. Okay. The, uh, okay, so I told you about yesterday, and I told you about cosmic microwave background radiation. Uh, but I didn't finish the summary of the Indian part. Maybe I should have put it up later. 
uh, and about the future. So we'll come back to this. So I have shown you two pictures from this Bell Telephone Laboratory. Uh, it is already mentioned that the first detection of radio waves from outer space was in 1932. Okay? And the name was also mentioned, Jansky. And his name is used for, still used, to measure the intensity of radio waves coming from some direction. Hmm? Yeah. So one uh, Jansky is a very, very weak unit because these signals are very weak. So 10 raised to minus 26 watts. I think all of you know what a watt is. Coming on one meter square, and uh, these radio waves are spread over some range of frequencies. So you have to divide this by the range of frequencies. Okay. If you put a cell phone on the moon, you will get one Jansky. <laughs> okay. So uh, this person was able to detect it. This doesn't look like a telescope at all. Uh, but if you notice these wheels, it can be turned around and around. And he detected radiation from the center of our own galaxy. In the same Belgian phone lab, uh, these two gentlemen, who later on won the Nobel Prize, used this antenna, which was really made to look at uh, satellites, the reflections from satellites. Uh, they detected this cosmic microwave background radiation. Okay? Now, uh, so already in 1965, uh, this was known, but this radiation has now been studied in very great detail. Okay? And this is one of the latest pictures. So this is a picture which includes the entire sky. Uh, it's a bit like a map of the globe, where you cannot really present it in a plane, but one has, uh, this is say the North Pole, this is the South Pole. Now I should explain what the colors in this mean. I told you the temperature is 3 degrees Kelvin, but that has been subtracted out. That would not make a very interesting picture. That would just be a uniform uh, intensity. So what has been done is to plot the regions where there is excess emission, that is these regions, or regions where there is reduced emission. So these are called the fluctuations in the microwave background radiation. Planck is the name of the satellite which was used for this purpose launched by the European Space Agency. But what is interesting is these fluctuations are very small. If you take 3 degrees Kelvin as the average, the deviations from the average are just uh, uh, one part in one lakh, right? So they are measured in micro degrees. Now you may say, why is one interested in measuring such small things in micro degrees? The answer is that without these fluctuations, we would not have galaxies, stars, planets today. If the universe was completely uniform, there is no reason for part of the universe to uh, collapse and form an object uh, like a galaxy or a star. So uh, it's very important that these were actually measured because uh, the theory told us that without these fluctuations, it is impossible to produce galaxies. But now that they've been measured, people have become more ambitious and they would construct models to explain exactly how many galaxies we have what are their sizes? What is the distribution space? So that is a major branch of stuff. So I, I, I will now leave this field of cosmology and come to uh, another object which is also mentioned, right? Uh, pulsar. Now the word pulsar stands for pulsating radio source. Okay? It's a name given by astronomers in Cambridge University. Uh, however, it's not an appropriate name. Pulsating suggests that you have an object which keeps increasing and decreasing in size, like your heart. Okay. But uh, these are actually rotating objects. But when they were discovered, their nature was completely unknown. I will show you a picture later of uh, the first discovery. They found extremely regularly spaced pulses. They're so regular that the suspicion was that, you know, after all, many uh, human instruments produce very regularly phase pulses. Could it be that these were coming from some extraterrestrial intelligence? But finally, uh, a more natural explanation was found because many of them were found in all directions in the sky. Uh, today, thousands are known. And the idea is that you have a star which is emitting a beam of radio waves, and uh, when it rotates, the beam will keep crossing your radio telescope. So the intensity seen by your radio telescope will go up and down. 
and then after one rotation period you will again see a pulse okay now this idea that you could have such stars which could rotate once per second okay because these pulses were coming once per second so the sun rotates uh, once a month right so a normal star cannot rotate once per second okay but it had been predicted that uh, not the sun but heavier stars will end their lives uh, just to tell you these stars are uh, millions of kilometers in size but uh, after consuming the nuclear fuel they would end their lives a size of around 10 kilometers obviously when the same mass is packed into a smaller size the density will go up so the density will be that of an atomic nuclear and that is uh, enormous density huh? if you want it in your familiar units uh, of uh, grams per centimeter cubed it is 10 to the power of 15 okay anyway the prediction was made in 1932 and like many theoretical predictions uh, it was forgotten but when these uh, uh, rotating neutron stars were discovered using radio waves uh, now i want to tell you a little more stories about this so uh, jacqueline bell is the name of the research student who was working in cambridge he was not looking for pulsars he was looking for a phenomenon which is like the twinkling of stars okay now our stars twinkle not because they are pulsating but because uh, they pass through the earth's atmosphere and similarly radio uh, sources will show twinkling phenomena passing through the earth's ionosphere and also uh, passing through uh, the region surrounding the sun okay so the date is given here in those days uh, they didn't have very sophisticated computers so the output of the radio telescope was recorded on a chart like this and you can see these are absolutely equally spaced pulses to help you they have provided some ticks here and this is really there so this entire thing is 10 10 seconds right first of all so here is a picture of uh, Dustin Bell at Cambridge when she was a research student now this telescope is not the telescope with which she discovered a pulsar in another radio telescope at Cambridge and i will be telling you more about this uh, because uh, uh, when the nobel prize was awarded for the discovery of pulsar it was shared by two people one was uh, martin rail who is an astronomer who discovered the principle of combining the signals from many radio telescopes okay and we will be talking a lot about combining signals from different radio telescopes and the other person was uh, the thesis supervisor of uh, jocelyn bell anthony hewish Uh, actually nobel prize has room for one more person but in those days the nobel committee <coughs> did not give uh, the nobel prize usually to the students of course things have changed now but you'll be happy to hear that uh, just a few years ago jocelyn bell was awarded uh, a discovery prize fundamental discovery prize which is three times the nobel prize and uh, the other thing which tells you something about her character as a person is that she immediately gave it away to the institute of physics for them to use to fund uh, young people uh, who want to enter science especially those from groups who do not normally enter science among which she included women okay so a remarkable discovery made by a remarkable person i told you that uh, jansky discovered radio waves from the center of our galaxy and the early radio astronomers found radio waves coming from other galaxies but the pictures were not good enough to say where is it coming from uh where sorry but the total energy of the radio waves was not in all galaxies but in some of galaxies was more than the energy of all the light coming from the sun and as the pictures became better and better it became clear that the source of energy was uh, right in the center okay so uh what is the source it is enormous amount of energy coming out of a very small volume and uh, this is where again i will have to uh, not give you details at this point after decades uh, people tried various models but none of them could explain the enormous energy and small size until they came up with this model of a rotating black hole uh, not uh, the end state of a star but much more than that much bigger uh, millions of billions of times the mass of the sun but gas has to fall onto it and in the process of falling it picks up a lot of speed and it also 
goes round and round. And uh, this process seems to generate uh, a lot of energy in the form of beams. And what we see is very indirect. We only see the radio waves coming when these beams collide with the surrounding matter. I'll show you a picture. <coughs> but these pictures could only be made by the 1980s because this new technique, which is combining radio telescopes, and the technical name for that is interferometry, was needed. Now, I'll give you a very simple idea of interferometry. Uh, if I have two radio telescopes and one source of radio waves, depending on where the source is, the signals will reach the two radio telescopes at different times. So if you're able to measure this time delay <coughs> between the arrival of the signal at different radio telescopes, it will tell you something about where the source is located. Now, actually, it's not so simple because there'll be many sources and there'll be many radio telescopes. But with appropriate mathematics, you can actually uh, take the signals from all the radio telescopes, look at different values of the delay, and locate all the sources, and thereby make a very nice picture. So here is a more modern radio telescope, built according to this principle. It has 27 such large antennas. Uh, VLA stands for Very Large Array, Array being you know, a group of radio telescopes. Uh, and these are put on railway tracks, and they can be moved even to a distance of 30 kilometers. So it's as if you have built a radio telescope whose size is uh, 30 kilometers. The J stands for Jansky. But one important thing I do want to tell you about this particular observatory, it was entirely built and funded and designed in the United States. But the moment they opened the observatory, they announced the policy of open skies, which means if you had an idea uh, of solving some important astronomical problem by observing radio waves, you could submit this to a committee, and the committee would immediately uh, send it to experts. And depending the best possible use of the telescope, regardless of where the person is from, uh, the time would be allotted. Because telescope time is a very precious resource. So typically, in any good telescope, uh, it's a bit like uh, IITs. Right? Of course, IITs are terrible because you know, 10,000 people get in, but maybe lakhs of people write the exam. Here, typically, the number of applications for observing time, they exceed the amount of time available by a factor of five or two. So here is one of the most beautiful pictures made with this telescope. And it illustrates what I was telling you. There is a galaxy sitting here, and as seen in visible light, the galaxy is only this much. And this is the center of that galaxy. You can see a very weak source of radio waves here. But you also see this jet this beam. So all the energy is being produced here, probably by the black hole. So you can see this beam. You can also see another beam going in the reverse direction. And when these beams strike the gap surrounding the galaxy, these become powerful sources of radio waves. So again, you know, you could have an entire uh, talk on these <laughs> radio galaxies. And Professor Saroop himself made a major contribution to the study of radio galaxies which I will tell you about, he and his students. Now I come to the greatest achievement of this technique of interferometry, which happened only a few years ago. Okay. Uh, so first look at this picture. This is the entire Earth. Okay. And these dots show the locations of various telescopes. See, in the case of uh, the array which I showed you earlier, the telescopes were located 30 kilometers apart. Now we are talking of telescopes which are located 10,000 kilometers apart. Hello? Hello? No, no uh, problem, sir. No problem. Uh, let, me, let me continue. Huh? No problem. Yeah. So, <laughs> notice that this is one telescope in Hawaii, this is one in Spain, this is one in Arizona, and then one in the South Pole, one in uh, and many telescopes actually in Chile. And the signals from these telescopes are combined using a similar technique to what I described earlier. And their target was the center of one of these galaxies which I told you about. Right? So here are pictures of all these telescopes. And uh, I told you that uh, the resolution of a telescope depends on the wavelength. So they went to the shortest possible wavelength, which is about, uh, in this case, about uh, 2.6 millimeters. Okay? And they combined the signals. Now. <laughs> If you go to the previous picture, 
combining the signals from these is very straightforward because uh, in 30 kilometers you can use optical fiber to combine the signals. How do you combine the signals from a telescope in the South Pole? So the answer is that the signals were recorded in each place separately and after a month all the things were sent by train or by ship to a common place in Germany and also one here and the signals were combined in the computer. Okay. So this is an experiment which took almost a decade to set up and uh, this is the image they made which I am sure every one of you has seen because it appeared in every newspaper and it is a ring of radio waves. Okay. And what is amazing is the size uh, of this. This size is small enough so that one can actually see this region. Now you can there's nothing to see in this region. Right? But that is the whole point of this observation. If there's a black hole, radiation which passes too close to the black hole will fall in and you will not see it. But radiation which just misses the black hole will form a ring. Okay. So this has been predicted for a very long time and this was finally observed. And therefore, this has given tremendous confidence in the model which I told you that uh, you have uh, such black holes at the centers of galaxies on which gas falls and it emits radio waves and so on and so forth. So again, uh, recently I will have to leave this story. But here is another picture which shows you uh, where the telescopes are located, right? Because one picture is not enough, half the earth. Okay. So I, I think this is a very impressive picture. <laughs> now uh, we come to the second part of my talk, which is about uh, the Indian scene. So uh, I told you that the rapid growth of radio astronomy started in the early 1950s, okay? And uh, by the mid 1960s, so 1963 for Govind Swaroop and uh, 1972 for Radha Krishnan, uh, they were eminent radio astronomers who were working abroad, uh, but who then decided to come back to India and uh, carry out research in radio astronomy in India. And uh, I have worked in the Raman Research Institute group, uh, and I have also worked in this group. So I know uh, both these people very well. And the interesting thing is, uh, when though they came back to India, uh, they continued to be very active and influential in the international community of radio astronomers. You know, in in terms of being on all committees, advising uh, other radio telescopes, and therefore they could uh, attract some of the best people. So. I had the advantage of meeting some of the best astronomers in the world. And of course, they built up their own programs with telescopes and most important with students. So these are two people, but today perhaps, you know, there may be 50 people or, or more who have studied under them or studied under their students and for pursuing radio science. Okay. And what is really interesting is that these did not function as rival groups. Each had its own interests, its own instruments. But there was a very free exchange of ideas and even an exchange of people. Like I told you that I moved from the uh, Raman Institute to the TIFR. And uh, in fact, other people moved from the TIFR to the Raman Institute. Okay. So that's a brief account of the Indian scene. And now I'll show you some of the radio telescopes. But first, let's look at these two personalities. Uh, these are uh, relatively older pictures of uh, Professor Rook. I think this, he must have been in the 70s when this picture was taken, right? I mean, he has gray hair and, or not much hair, but you can see that his face is completely youthful. He's enjoying himself, and the same is true of uh, Radha uh, Both are no more. Both are born in 1929, uh, both are no more. But I've also included pictures of them when they were abroad, working earlier. So Sarup actually went abroad in the early 1950s and worked in Australia. Okay? And this is a picture of him taken in Australia. And the reduction went a bit later, and this is him in California Institute of Technology. Uh, actually, you, it's very easy to guess which of these people happens to be uh, this person, right? It has to be this man. I mean, you can just see from. Um, so uh, everyone called uh, Professor Rup Govind. So I used to call him Professor Rup, but within a few months he told me, no, please call me Govind. And likewise, everyone called Radha Krishnan uh, Rad. Okay. So because of the first at the Raman Institute, I'll show you some of the radio telescopes 
which were built at the Raman Research Institute. Okay. Uh, it was a smaller group, and the projects were less ambitious. And these three don't look like telescopes at all. And the reason is that they operate at a very long wavelength. Okay. So this was two meters, right? And this is uh, eight point five meters. This was built in Karnataka in Gauri Bidhanu. So uh, these poles, which you can see, support a network of wires which you cannot see. Uh, okay, you can see a little bit here. So the radio signals are picked up by these wires, and of course you might think that the radio signals will go through. <laughs> That's not true, because there is a bunch of wires here which reflect the radio waves. Okay, uh, and this uh, is a joint venture of uh, the Raman Institute and the Indian Institute of Astrophysics. All these three. Uh, one of the problems in astronomy is that if you live in the northern hemisphere, you can't see the south southern part of the sky. So this uh, radio telescope was built in Mauritius, which is in the southern hemisphere. Okay, jointly by Indian Institute of Astrophysics and the Raman Research Institute. And finally, all these are very long wavelengths of meters, as I said, eight meters, two meters, and so on. This one is at the short wavelength of 2.6 millimeters, which I mentioned. Uh, this telescope was active for about a decade, from 1985 to 1995, and many, uh, at least uh, several of the people who worked on this telescope, actually later on went and joined uh, this project which I told you, uh, in which telescopes were combined from all over the world. Okay, so although this telescope, uh, in fact, is being taken down, because technology advances very fast, so at the time it was built, this telescope could do observations. Uh, which could uh, then be published in international journals. But very soon, the technology became so advanced that any telescope located in Bangalore could not compete because Bangalore is not high enough. Uh, uh, these uh, very short wavelengths are absorbed by the Earth's atmosphere. So all the millimeter telescopes that I showed you are located on the top of high mountains or in very cold places. Okay? So, so much for the radio telescopes of the Raman Research Institute. I won't tell you much about the science. Uh, now let's come to the uh, TIFR group. And as I said, the two groups work together. So even before I joined the TIFR group, uh, I was very familiar with uh, the work going on there. And I'm sure uh, uh, Dr. Gangarajan was in fact at TIFR at that time. He was not doing radio astronomy, but all his friends were doing radio astronomy. So this is, uh, you can see it's a pretty large telescope. Okay. Um, in fact, uh, this is a picture taken from Google. So it means this, this telescope is so big. So each one of these frames which you see here, uh, you can see all those frames here and they are casting shadows. And this is a road coming up to the, this is the main building. And the interesting thing is that this is built on a hill, it's built on a slope. Uh, again, I can explain why it is built on a slope later. So the radio signals, again, you cannot see the most important part of this telescope, which is a number of wires, which reflect the radio waves to this point, right? And uh, yeah. Okay. So this was the first venture of the Tata Institute. Actually, Raman, uh, Tata Institute of Fundamental Research is sometimes just called Tata Institute. Okay. Um, then, um, this group had already established a lot of the technology and techniques for working at wavelengths of a few meters. Most of the world was working at shorter wavelengths, as I already told you. But uh, certain objects emit much more, like pulsars, emit much more at longer wavelengths. And in particular, uh, hydrogen, which is the most abundant element in the universe, if it is in the form of neutral atoms in space, not even molecules, but atoms, then it emits at a wavelength of 20 centimeters. And if it is very far away, it will emit at even longer wavelengths because of the expansion of the universe. So this telescope called Giant Meter Wave Radio Telescope was designed by Professor Rupa Nishpani. It started and uh, we followed the lead. So by then, I had, by 2002, I had joined the group when all the hard work of building the telescope was over. Okay, and in any case, 
being a theoretical person, I could not have helped much with that. Okay. So this was upgraded and made open to observers from all over the world. I'm happy to say that even today, uh, the number of people who want observing time is more than the amount of time which GMRT has. So it's open to international participation, right? Uh, so I've just given you more details. So these are the observers from India. And then if you look at the next one, probably United Kingdom, in fact, there's a very interesting story here. There's a particular astronomer from Cambridge who used to come very often to observe pulsars and other things. Okay. So one day when he came, the people at the observatory asked him, hey, where have you been? You've been away for some time. But they thought that he's a person who lives in Pune and occasionally goes away. Okay. A lot of people from the USA, uh, this is probably Netherlands, which has a very strong, or Australia, a very strong radio astronomy community. Okay. So you can see that, yeah, here is the factor. Uh, if you have one hour of observing time available, uh, you may have 2.5 people requesting 2.5 hours. Okay. Yeah. So this is just to tell you that this is uh, a facility which is being used by people all over the world. Uh, and the scientific results have been in the two areas which I mentioned, mainly, uh, actually three areas which I mentioned, I would say. One is uh, the study of hydrogen, the second is the study of pulsars, and the third is the study of radio galaxies. So all these have been pursued, and uh, now I mentioned upgrade. Now, uh, what is interesting is UTI radio telescope, the mechanical structure has basically the same structure which is there in 1970, 50 years old. So it's a credit to the engineer uh, who built it that uh, it's uh, still functioning, still rotating, and so on. And the GMRT, again, the antennas were put up in 1994. So that's already we are nearing 30 years. Okay. However, the electronics has to be changed every 10 years or so because uh, mechanical engineering doesn't change much, and anyway, it's very expensive to build a new telescope. But uh, new electronics have been put, and uh, this is a very technical graph. But I'll give you the general idea. The general idea says that this is the sensitivity of the telescope. So if the number is small, it means you can detect a very weak radio source. So anything which is in the bottom of this diagram is better than anything which is in the top of this diagram. And of course, it depends on frequency. So by the way, your mobile phones operate somewhere in this range of frequency. Or that is uh, 2G, and 3G operates somewhere here. Okay. So what this diagram is supposed to show, that the original GMRT was here, and the upgraded GMRT is now here. And these are some of the competing telescopes. Okay, of course the wavelength is different. It shows that at least for 10 years more, GMRT will continue to be one of the best telescopes in the world. Okay. Now I have to tell you what is the SKA. Okay. SKA stands for Square Kilometer Array. So uh, building these large radio telescopes was proving to be very expensive. Um, so you'd be surprised how India was able to build one. And the answer is that Professor Swarov came up with some very important ideas whereby it could be built for a lower cost. Okay. Uh, but still, if you want to uh, go to higher frequencies, if you want to make it more sensitive, uh, there is no way, no escape. You have to build a larger number of antennas to combine. You need powerful computers to combine it. And uh, you need uh, the best electronics. So the cost of these radio telescopes keeps going up, and the, the next big radio telescope will not belong to any one country. Right? Uh, it's a joint effort of people all over the world, and that's why it's called square kilometer array. Now I should explain what is square kilometer. That refers to the area which collects the radio waves. Okay. The actual radio telescopes are distributed over thousands of kilometers, right? But uh, so for comparison, if you take uh, the GMRT, uh, the total area of that is much less than one square kilometer, right? Even though each dish is large and there are 30 antennas, much less, right? The other improvement which will take place in the SKA 
SKA is not built yet, by the way, and this is the kind of telescope that takes 10 years to build. Okay. So most radio telescopes up to this time had only a single receiver of radio wave. Okay. Whereas even your mobile phone camera has a CCD, which has uh, you know megapixels. Now radio astronomy is not going to megapixels, but at least they could put you know a, maybe some 30 pixels here. So that's another thing which makes this telescope much more powerful. So this telescope is being built. Uh, India is also part of the international group which is building this radio telescope. And uh, uh, NCRA and RRI and others are involved. And what is interesting is that uh, India has been given the responsibility for designing a major piece of software. So in 2005, we had a conference in Pune and uh, Two of the software engineers from PIFR, earlier from PIFR, then working with uh, TCS, gave a talk to these radio astronomers. And they didn't talk radio astronomy, they talked software. And the group was so impressed that, you know, a decade later, the design of software, a part of the software for the telescope, was given as India's uh, contribution to this internet. Now, I want to show you some of the other innovative radio telescopes that have been built. Uh, this is a radio telescope. You see all these poles. So it looks very much like the telescopes you saw at Dauri Benino, except that these are metal poles, so it's not wooden poles. So this is another one. And normally, you don't build radio telescopes in densely populated countries, because all human activities generate radio waves, which are much more powerful than the radio waves coming from outer space. Okay. Uh, however, uh, in Netherlands, they came up with some very ingenious ways of uh, rejecting the local signal. And they came up with some very interesting designs. So this doesn't look like a telescope, it looks like an agriculture field. But these are all individual units like tiles, and the signals are combined. And such units have been distributed all over Europe. So this is a very powerful telescope. And it works at, uh, and the antennas. Uh, uh, okay. Now, uh, I'm coming toward the end of my talk, uh, though I said the talk is meant to increase your uh, information and curiosity about radio astronomy, not to give you any details. So, toward the end, I would like to, I was asked by this magazine called Current Science to write something about radio astronomy. And this is already 16 years ago when I happened to be uh, in Pune. And uh, I mainly talked about what are the prospects for students entering radio astronomy. And it's not very clear, so I may have to read it. Hmm? What prospects await those students who take up research in astronomy? Facilities in India are getting better. I would like to imagine or hope that each one of the students that I see studying supernovae or small multiple galaxies or pulsars or microquasars with GMRT feels that her share of excitement and exploration of looking at something of her own not seen before. Now, normally, uh, people always, nowadays, in order to be uh, sensitive, they say uh, she instead of saying he. But in this case, I am not being politically correct. It turns out that all these four research students were all women working in NCRA in 2004. Okay? A reasonable PhD in astronomy should also offer broad training in modeling physical processes, analyzing objects. So interestingly, all four of them uh, now uh, work as faculty members at different observatories. Okay. So my prediction made in 2004 was correct. Uh, I think uh, one of them came back to NCRA and other people went to other places. So this is just to say that if anything, the opportunity for students entering this field with square kilometer array and so on, are even better than they were in 2004. Um, um, now, these are just some of my personal thoughts. I myself have retired, but uh, as I said, this is a field uh, where a lot of uh, progress has been made in India. And to carry the progress forward, I'm not saying that everyone should join. So, radio astronomy is not the only game in town. In fact, I can recommend to you uh, names of my colleagues in the Indian School of Astrophysics who will tell you that optical astronomy is also equally promising. But this is a very interesting uh, proverb, which I believe when it goes back to some very great physicists, you should never work in a field unless you have an unfair advantage. Okay? 
or uh, you have a good start. So someone entering radio astronomy in India today has this advantage. There are good facilities, good people who can advise you, and good international contacts. Now you might think this is a very narrow field, but actually it is not. Okay, uh, it is very interdisciplinary. It involves physics. It involves engineering. So in fact, a lot of uh, if you go to NCRA today and ask who are the two people who are occupying uh, senior positions there, there's a director and there's a dean. Okay, uh, and the direct, uh, both of them happen to be engineering graduates from IIT Kanpur, who later on moved to astronomy. Okay. So uh, if many of you are engineering students, that doesn't mean you cannot join. There are very interesting mathematical problems which I have worked on, and of course, fantastic problems in computer science because the size of the data is so much, and you need very good algorithms. Hmm? And even if you do a PhD in radio astronomy, you don't have to stick to it. Many people go into other fields. In fact, uh, one of the people whom I remember, uh, he might, of course, he might have retired. He's called George Verdes. He was the main software person in uh, UT Radio Telescope. And then later on, he became one of the first scientists in Centrum, the Kerala State uh, Project for Electronics and Technology. Now, do we just wait for people to join? Or maybe we set up some kind of master's program? right? And my general argument is so much money is being invested in, but not enough is being invested in people. So uh, JAP refers to Joint Astronomy Program, which is at the Indian Institute of Science. I said, each I said usually has a few astronomers. So my uh, general conclusion is that uh, the 20th century was a great century for radio astronomy, but now the tools have become much more sophisticated. And that's not a disadvantage, that's an advantage. So, um, you learn those tools, you can do many things. So uh, SKA, as I told you, is not yet built. And one of, uh, interestingly, SKA is going to be located partly in South Africa, partly in Australia. Now, South Africa is a developing country, just like India. So I put up this slide, mainly to show people that a country which you normally regard as developing, you know, not very wealthy and so on, can still invest in science of this kind. And certainly in South Africa believes that uh, by investing in this telescope, they will ultimately gain in terms of uh, the technology developed and so on. The technology is closely related to space technology and uh, communication technology, computer technology, and so on. So these are all the reasons why I think uh, radio astronomy has a very good future. And uh, I would like to stop here uh, and uh, take, I'm hoping that we'll have a lively discussion of this. <coughs> Thank you, Dr. Rajaram Nityan, sir, uh, mm -hmm. for your marvelous talk. And uh, we got an idea how the, the blackboard from M87 was uh, was illustrated by the computers and the signals we received. And and from the beginning of this radio astronomy and, astronomy and its scope in future, and I'm sure that a few of our students, <coughs> the real science aspirants, may get inspired and they will search in your way of radio astronomy. That's that the way you presented these things and uh, the scope of that is very, uh, very well for, uh, described here. And uh, we, <coughs> we are ever thankful to you to guide these students. And, and in this occasion, we thank Dr. S. Raghavan <laughs> who suggested your presence in this uh, occasion. And we have Dr. Vyate Hegde and Padmanabhan sir and a lot of people from ISRO and our chief mentor E.K. Kuti sir is there. And our students are get uh, excited with this uh, knowledge and its uh, scope of this uh, subject. And I'm sure that we'll face a good question and session after this wonderful talk and inspiring talk. And we'll get uh, more nourished with these informations. And, uh, and I, I feel proud that our DMR is subscribed 2.5 times than its capacity. And I want some more clarification on that subscription also here from you, sir, when these, among these question and sessions. And, uh, and before we are entering to these question and sessions, I invite E.K. Kutisa to make a reflection on this wonderful uh, talk on this day. Thanks, Jill Marsh. 
it has been an excellent talk and a wonderful day for all of us our students and the invitees and uh, i must uh, thank the speaker for readily agreeing and delivering this talk and the all credit for our ability to bring uh, dr nityananda to this group is with goes to dr s rangarajan our well wisher always our well wisher and he, he has been uh, making us think about new new things and new avenues and uh, this is one such effort from him and i thank him a great deal and uh, in this talk uh, a point uh, a passing reference was made to the investment in people of course that is one of the very very important things that should happen and uh, investment in research is important investment in snt is important technology and all at the same time people very very thing and uh, we are in a very very modest way helping in that in assembling in gathering assembling identifying getting students uh, at the high school level and uh, kindle their interest in uh, science so the, i i with this uh, saturday webinar that has picked up a very big momentum and it has spread beyond uh, this 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 holy code talikat it has gone all over kerala and beyond our borders in several other areas so i am uh, so this uh, this investment in people is a very 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 excellent thing now we have been longing for this talk on this topic for quite long ever since we began our webinar in may 2020 epidemic era but it has happened now so first of all i thank dr gangarajan so soon after uh, this uh, 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 dr nityananda agreed to come and deliver this talk i got a call from my good friend dr jodi bashu who is here uh, um you know, professional uh, link with uh, dr govind sir professor govind sir so and jodi was also one such so i got a few this thing then jodi called me and said then why don't you uh, try dr nityananda so i told him it has just happened uh, he has kindly consented to be with us so i'm what i'm saying is, is this uh, dr rajaram nityananda has been in the uh, uh, radar of many people when it comes to uh, uh, the um, astrophysics and radio astronomy so thank you very much sir for an excellent time you have spent with us and uh, uh, and we are uh, aware that you had a close link with the three uh, uh, nobel physicists uh, nobel laureates who got the nobel prize this year who in uh, astrophysics and we will be again blessed with an occasion to hear you about their work so we'll we'll come back to you with a request for that in 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 at your convenience at your convenience so uh, and uh, our students are uh, getting <clears throat> i think some connectivity problem with you sir yeah yeah that's happening there on it Okay, sir. Maybe you should. Uh, we, 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 uh, yes, yes. Uh, that that, that may be. Sure. So okay. this is the only occasion we got it. So thank you very much, sir. So now the session gets open for a discussion, question and answers. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, good sir. Before we going to the Q and A session, I want few words from our uh, our honourable Dr. S. Dengaraj sir on this topic, sir. <laughs> I'm so so overwhelmed because Rajaram and I have known each other since the beginning of the uh, MSc days in IIT, and uh, 
anytime, anywhere, anybody asks me, can you name one person who is the best in explaining concepts and who can inspire people, talk on any topic like that, always used to think of Raja Raman. So that's why when I talked to Kutti, I said, you have to get him here, especially when I knew the youngsters were all part of this club. I'm sure they would have loved to hear, uh, have heard uh, Raja Ram and be ready to shoot out questions at him. So I would rather uh, withdraw at this stage except to express my great happiness of having enjoyed uh, such a beautiful lecture on radio astronomy. Thanks, Raja Ram, and thanks all of you. Thank, thank you, Rangarai, sir. We are, we are so happy and glad to see that you are always with us for these students. And it's our turn to uh, with this uh, Questions or sessions, and I invite Bharat Srijit and Sriram and team Varun to handle this wonderful questions or session. It will be a good exploration of this great genius by these students. Welcome. Thank you so much, Shajil sir. Uh, I hope I am visible and audible and ready to go. So, first of all, uh, it is my honor to express a sincere gratitude to. Dr. Rajaram Nityananda. In fact, uh, listening from a person of your class is, in fact, uh, a great honor for all the students who have gathered here. And a special thank you to Dr. S. Rangarajan, who has been part of us, who has been on this journey for months or even a couple of years since we have been able to meet him a couple of years back. And uh, since then, Dr. Rangarajan has also been a part of our journey. And uh, thank you so much to all of you. Uh, for staying here and being part of our journey for months. Now, uh, in fact, it, I've told you it is a great difficult kind of thing to uh, moderate a Q&A session considering the huge amount of questions that come up and I'm only uh, able to be selecting a few relevant questions from them and asking Dr. Rajaram Nityananda. So please do pardon me if I'm, uh, if I'm forced to avoid questions from your part uh, because of the limited amount of time we are uh, we are allowed to. So the first question is from Archana TM. And uh, sir, you've talked about the techniques of interferometry and interferometers. So the question is, so what is the basic principle behind the interferometers? So um, in fact, I had a question to add upon this particular thing. We've heard about the LIGO observatory where they have an interferometer there as well, as well as the fact that the EHT or the Event Horizon Telescope had used a technique called very long baseline interferometry. So I would like to uh, ask Dr. Rajaram Nityananda what ba the basic technique of interferometry is and what is the difference in the technique used by LIGO and the EHT? Uh, okay, so uh, can I also ask uh, 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 which uh, standard she's studying just so that I can try and use those concepts. Uh, in explaining uh, I think the uh, first question was from uh, Archana TM and I think she is a ninth standard student. The second okay. question was from myself okay. and I'm yeah, yeah, that's fine. Yes. Okay. So uh, basically, okay, first of all, let me take care of LIGO. Hmm? So LIGO is a little different from the radio situation. So in LIGO, you have uh, some mirrors which are placed at the ends of some vacuum tubes and what uh, the incoming gravitational wave does is to change the distance between these mirrors by a very minute amount. So really, the interference of light hmm, um, is used to measure these very small changes. In, so all the interference is taking place, uh, and the source of the light is a uh, terrestrial source. Huh? So, the connection to gravitational waves is indirect. So I will leave aside LIGO. Again, I would strongly urge you to, uh, I have friends and colleagues who would be very willing to talk to this group, and they can tell you more. So coming to Athena's question, in the main lecture, I said that uh, we basically measured the difference in distances from the source to the two telescopes. Okay? So if, uh, I think you know enough geometry, if I have two telescopes, if I draw what is called the perpendicular bisector of the two telescopes, of course, on that perpendicular bisector, we have equal distance from the two telescopes. As I move it away to one side, the distance will change. Now, when you change the distance, what happens is uh, you have waves coming from the source, uh, and the waves, uh, as you know, can be both positive and negative. So, if the difference in distance is half a wavelength, the two waves will cancel, 
and that is something you may study in later standards and that is what is called interference of light or radio waves hmm? and if the difference is one wavelength again they will combine and give you a stronger wave and so on so this is the basic principle that the location of the source in the sky shows itself in what we call phase differences but if you don't like the word phase difference i would simply call it difference in distance of the source of radio wave from the two telescopes so now if you is a kind of survey so if you know the difference of distance between many telescopes then you can actually uh, uh, work out not just one source you can work out the direction of many sources of radio wave now underlying this is a piece of mathematics i just mention it and maybe you can study it later it is what is called fourier analysis f o u r i e r maybe i can put in the chat box here yeah. so that is just in case uh, it's unlikely i mean i don't know too many night standard students who study fourier analysis but so this is the branch of mathematics which allows you to uh, take the waves coming at different telescopes and combine them in various ways and make a map of the sky okay so so i hope uh, that's the best answer i could give <laughs> Uh, thank you so much sir so the next question is from manasa k krishnan and her question is has the important astronomical event supernova 1054 in constellation taurus played any role in the discovery of pulsars in fact i believe uh, sn1054 happens to be i think crab nebula and i've heard uh, that crab nebula has been uh, one of the one of the first objects to be observed in radio frequency and i believe it has been a breakthrough in the field of radio astronomy as well so i would like dr rajaram nityananda to please uh, do tell us how important this particular event was uh, in the history of radio astronomy itself. okay so the simple answer to manasa's question is uh, yes very much okay now uh, however uh, i can tell you a little more i can give you a longer story on that uh, this crab nebula uh, was seen by chinese astronomers you know more than uh, Thousand years ago, nearly thousand years ago, uh, but they saw it as a very bright uh, uh, star, which over about one year became faint. Okay, then when astronomers in the 20th century looked in the same location, they did not see any star, but they saw uh, nebula. Nebula is the word used by astronomers for a cloud of gas. Okay, but this cloud was emitting a lot of light. and then in the early days of radio astronomy before the discovery of pulsars this nebula itself was found to be a source of radio waves but then the question is if there is no star there what is giving energy to this nebula okay and this is an important problem so actually it is very interesting uh, many of you would have heard the name of hoyle and of course jan narlikar uh, so hoyle and narlikar and another very famous scientist called wheeler in 1964 They said that crab nebula must have a neutron star in the center, but the only <laughs> mistake they made—not mistake, the only place where the guess was not correct—they said that this neutron star is pulsating. That is, its radius is increasing and decreasing. But a few years later, uh, uh, Italian astronomers said, "Look, this uh, pulsating will be damped, whereas if an object is rotating, it will not be damped." and all this is before the discovery of pulsars <coughs> so the moment pulsars were discovered jocelyn bell at cambridge was not able to detect the crab the pulsar in the crab nebula but uh, astronomers in the united states who had a very huge radio telescope so an arecibo radio telescope okay uh, they were able to detect pulsars from the crab nebula and uh, i should tell you that this pulsar is rotating 30 times per second whereas the pulsar detected by the cambridge group were rotating about once or at most twice per second huh? so it shows that a uh, neutron star can rotate very rapidly so you can ask is 30 uh, 30 times per second the record and the answer is no the current record for the maximum rotation speed of a pulsar is something like 630 times per second so think of an astronomical object which is uh, rotating once every 1.5 milliseconds and the interesting thing is that this was again discovered by a research student in the university of california berkeley uh, uh, his name is shrinivas kulkarni he studied in iit delhi and he is now of course a very famous astronomer 
at California Institute of Technology. Okay, so the Crab Nebula had a very important role, and Crab uh, pulsar has been studied at every wavelength, X-rays, uh, including uh, Astrosat. Astrosat also looks at Crab. <coughs> okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, in fact, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence or the SETI project is, in fact, something uh, students like us are extremely intrigued and uh, interested to know about. So, being a radio astronomer yourself, I hope you might have had a good experience in the SETI project, uh, at, if there are any. So, could you please tell us uh, something about the SETI project and some experiences of yours, if any? Okay, I have to frankly tell you that only a very small fraction of radio astronomers directly work on SETI. So I have not worked on SETI, uh, but I have met uh, some of the radio astronomers <coughs> who work on SETI. So it's an example of a field of science where the probability of your success is very, very small. But if you succeed, then <laughs> the reward for you in terms of making a fundamental discovery is very, very large. Okay? So you may observe for decades and see nothing. Okay? So today, a lot of the SETI work is done. Uh, uh, one of the interesting ways it's done is take an existing radio telescope hmm, and put one additional receiver on it. So no matter where the telescope points, that receiver will go on collecting data. And interestingly, the SETI signals may also be similar to the pulsar signal. They would have some non-random characteristic which would tell you that they are not being made by an astronomical object. Hmm. Uh, so far, there has been no success SETI. So I like to say, that I am more interested in terrestrial intelligence, like the students of the LU club. And uh, I am interested in persuading them to come and join our efforts in physics or astronomy or mathematics. I mean, all these fields are open to you. Hmm? Absolutely, sir. We uh, absolutely take that advice with both hands. And the next hmm. question is from Abhiram TP, and he happens to be a member of US Space Club. And his question is, sir, can you please describe about the Arecibo radio telescope in Puerto Rico? Uh, yes. Uh, you saw pictures of the GMRC dishes, which are uh, 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 very large, actually. Huh? Um, and of course, the larger the structure is, uh, a telescope will also point to all directions in the sky. So you need all kinds of mechanical uh, arrangements to rotate this telescope. So larger and larger radio telescopes become very, very expensive. Okay? So the largest uh, telescopes uh, which can be rotated are about 100 meters in diameter. But uh, what uh, American astronomers uh, decided is that in one island, which is off the coast of America called Puerto Rico, there was a valley which approximately had the shape of a, a spherical bowl. So they said, we will not build any mechanical structure. We will uh, put uh, metal reflectors all over this bowl and carefully align them so that they form the correct shape for a radio telescope. And then we will put receivers at the focus. Of, so, uh, in fact, if some of you are on uh, on Google, you can straight away Google Arecibo radio telescope and you get a beautiful picture of this uh, valley, which is 300 meters in diameter. Now, the disadvantage of this telescope is that you cannot rotate it. But of course, the Earth is rotating it in one direction. And by moving this focus, you can get a certain amount. So you have, what you have lost in the flexibility of pointing to any direction on the sky, you have gained in terms of the collecting area. But I also should tell you that today, Arecibo is not the biggest telescope of its kind. There is a particular area of China where not one, but they have a very large number of such valleys, natural phenomena. Okay? Uh, and they have built a 500 meter uh, diameter telescope. And learning from Arecibo, uh, they have actually uh, built it with a more advanced technology. And of course, uh, uh, nowadays, when people blame China for everything, so one could say Arecibo telescope recently suffered a big accident where a wire fell down and damaged the telescope. But I think this has nothing to do with China. It's just to do with an aging mechanical structure. So today, I would say the most powerful in terms of collecting area radio telescope in the world is this thing which is 500 meters in diameter, okay? Uh, which is, it's called FAST. And that's the name of the telescope. If you want to Google it, you can learn about all the exciting science going on there. So basically it would be used to detect extremely faint signals. Or 
if you want to see pulsars you can see pulsars which are much further away okay so that's briefly the story of these large single aperture radio telescopes my lecture concentrated more on uh, not having a single large radio telescope but having a large area split up into number of smaller radio telescopes which are then can be scattered all over the country or all over the world Thank you, sir. The next question is from another UL Space Club member, and his name is Adil Krishna. And his question is, sir, can you please tell us some of the main discoveries of the giant meter wave radius telescope? Okay. So um, the initial two aims, which was stated by Professor Govind Sarup, uh, the three aims he stated, and in fact, he and his colleagues wrote an article in Current Science uh, even before the telescope was built, saying this is what we want to do. So one is, uh, I showed you these pictures of radio galaxies. Okay, now radio galaxies emit at a large range of wavelengths. If you want the highest resolution, you have to go to very short wavelengths. So you may ask, why go to longer wavelengths? And the reason is that uh, there are certain uh, with at shorter wavelengths, you only see the central region. If you are interested in the outermost region, what is called the halo of radio galaxy, then you have to go to longer wavelengths. Okay. And there is a lot of interest in the physics of the halo, so that is one goal. Hmm? Or the way Gurman used to express it, we are interested in the old electron. So an electron goes on emitting radio waves, it becomes tired, so it stops emitting high frequency radio waves, but it still emits low frequency radio waves. Hmm? <coughs> that is one. Second is pulsar, huh? and the third, and in a way the most uh, important perhaps, is the study of uh, hydrogen gas. So as I said, if hydrogen gas is present in other galaxy, you will receive the radiation at a wavelength of 21 centimeter. Now, because of the expansion of the universe, if it is in a very far away galaxy, the same radiation will now appear at 50 centimeter, or you know, one meter or two meter. So, if you want to study hydrogen in the very early phase of the universe, which is very very far away, uh, sorry, let me explain that. See, when astronomers keep looking at objects. Further and further away, you may say they are mapping out the universe. They are doing geography, but interestingly, they are not only doing geography; they are also doing history. The reason is that if I look at an object which is billion light years away, then I am seeing that object as it was billion years ago. And today, radio astronomers and optical astronomers are seeing objects not just one billion, but maybe six billion, you know, ten billion years ago. So, by studying the emission from hydrogen. Not at 21 centimeters, but at longer wavelengths, one can keep looking at more and more distant parts of the universe. And this has been one of the success stories of GMRT. Okay. And in the case of pulsars, uh, quite a few pulsars have been discovered in GMRT. Uh, uh, I'll mention two very interesting ones. One of them is orbiting around another object, and uh, the orbit is elliptical, and this holds the record for the most elongated ellipse. So those of you who know the geometry of the ellipse know this parameter called eccentricity. So this eccentricity is nearly 0.9 for this pulsar. Okay. Another uh, we mentioned Crab Nebula. Now uh, pulsar was located in the center of Crab Nebula. There was another nebula which uh, was somewhat similar to Crab but somewhat older. Crab is about thousand years old. Maybe this was two thousand years old. So people asked, isn't there a pulsar in this nebula? But uh, people were unable to detect it, and that's why this astronomer came from Cambridge. And he collaborated with uh, our own astronomers, and they were successful in finding what we call the older brother of the crab. Hmm? So, apart from discovering many pulsars and studying pulsars, uh, I would single out these two discoveries. I mentioned hydrogen, okay? Uh, and uh, at long wavelengths, uh, one of the first maps of the entire sky at a wavelength of two meters was produced using 2,000 hours of GMRT time, and this data was so big that it had. <laughs> The astronomers at NCRA were not able to analyze it fully, and uh, astronomers from, but it was still of great interest. So astronomers from Netherlands, along with a few younger students, they uh, put very powerful computers and very good algorithms, and they released uh, this map to the public, and that was very useful. So these are a few examples. And but what I want to emphasize is that every six months, you have. You know, every day there will be two or three astronomical projects which will be carried out. So the number of papers published using GMRT is very large. But I just singled out some of the highlights. 
Thank you, sir. The next question is from Dr. Emma Shivaraman, and I believe he might be a person whom you are quite familiar with. And the question is, sir, will large number of low orbiting communication satellites planned for internet service by many by countries? Many. Uh, excuse me, Shadil, sir. I think. Okay, yes. I think it's uh, okay. May I please continue with this? Yes. Okay, sir. The question is, will large number of low orbiting communication satellites planned for internet service by many countries affect radio astronomy observations. In fact, uh, when I myself tried searching about things like Starlink, one of the most important concerns uh, which came up from astronomers was uh, that some of the sky might be blocked by satellites and all sorts of stuff. And I believe you, uh, sir, is the best person to be answering this particular question. So uh, okay. what is your take on this, sir? Simple answer is yes. <laughs> It will interfere with radio astronomy observation. So one needs some international agreement that some range of wavelengths is reserved for radio astronomy. Uh, the advantage of GMRT was that when it was built, that area did not have much human activity, which generated radio waves. So for at least a decade, uh, GMRT astronomers were able to work without much of interference. Whereas the same wavelengths in other countries would have had a lot of interference. Okay. Uh, but once you have a satellite orbiting, then it's, uh, it's going to really create serious problems. So I think there are a lot of discussions going on at an international level to see uh, how this can be done. Of course, the radio astronomers also cannot uh, hold up uh, progress. So many people want the internet, they want mobile phones, and so on. So if, I, if you look at these sites in uh, South Africa and uh, Australia, which were picked, they're also picked because they are in completely uninhabited, uninhabited region. So perhaps, uh, you know, the uh, satellite operators may not send too much of signals to those places and so on. And ultimately, if you want to remain on Earth, the South Pole is a good place. <laughs> of course, it's very expensive to put a radio telescope at the South Pole, though you saw one. But interestingly, uh, the cost of this square kilometer array is as I told you, it was originally projected to be $1 billion. It may end up being 2 or $3 billion. But that is still very small compared to, if you take uh, the successor to Hubble Space Telescope, the cost is increasing by $1 billion every year. Okay. So if any astronomy can be done from Earth, people would prefer to do it from Earth rather than going to space. But in the long run, if you say 50 years from now, the best radio telescopes might be on the far side of the moon where the moon itself will shield you from all the harmful <laughs> uh, radio emissions from Earth. Okay? <laughs> so, uh, in the next decade, perhaps, we will still you know, be able to do useful radio astronomy from Earth, even GMRT. Later on, square kilometer array being located far away will continue to be useful for a couple of decades. In the very long run, we don't know. Thank you, sir. Uh, in fact, our U.S. Space Club member Abhiram TB has been quite curious and has asked what are the upcoming important projects in the field of radio astronomy and I believe some of them have been addressed by you in your answer to the previous question. Are there any other important uh, upcoming projects in the field of radio astronomy? Okay, I mentioned square kilometer array. That is the most ambitious project involving all countries. Uh, however, it does not go to very short wavelengths. Now you may ask why do you want to go to 2.6 millimeters? One is for resolution. The second is, I mentioned the importance of detecting hydrogen. But actually, uh, there is hydrogen in the atomic form. But if you have hydrogen in the molecular form, then to detect that, you have to go to this much shorter wavelength. Okay? And why are we interested in uh, uh, hydrogen in the molecular form? Because ultimately, uh, when you have gas in the atomic form, the density is very low. As the density becomes higher and higher, uh, which is needed in order to form stars and form planets, uh, you have to uh, look at molecular hydrogen. And you have to look at other molecules, like carbon monoxide, H2O, and so on. So if you want to study the formation of planets, the origin of life, and so on, you need very short wavelengths. And one of the best telescopes in that is called ALMA, A-L-M-A. So I would simply say, go and look it up, and you will get enormous information about this. Now, ALMA was also used for this EHT, but that is not the main purpose of ALMA. I should also mention that uh, in India, 
serious discussion going on involving ISRO also to put a millimeter wave telescope in in Ladakh because Ladakh would be as good a place as uh, maybe the South Pole or these high mountains in Chile to locate such telescopes. Uh, so yeah, Alma is one example of an upcoming project. It has just started operating and a lot of good science will come out. Uh, then I mentioned the Dutch project. So yes, I think I'd already anticipated that people will be interested in the future and I said something about it. And existing telescopes like uh, GMRT and VLA will keep improving their electronics, maybe build a few extra antennas. So, yeah. Thank you so much, sir. In fact, Abhiram, you're always free. You always have the option of coming up with some technologies in the future, if possible, yourself as well. So the next question, sir, is from Adidev JD, and he's a member of UL Space Club as well. And he's asked uh, you to please describe about quasars. We would also like to know how important radio astronomy is in understanding things like quasars, supermassive black holes, and all these kinds of things as well. Could you please explain about how important radio astronomy has been in this particular field? Okay. Now, uh, I mentioned that uh, I mentioned radio galaxies, and I said quite a lot about them. Basically, that you have a central black hole, and that, that uh, gas is falling onto it, and uh, as it falls down, uh, the potential energy released is converted to kinetic energy and then into heat. And then the heat energy is converted into uh, uh, radiation in all bands of the spectrum. And the rotation in particular generates magnetic fields and radio waves. Okay, I mean, that's a very brief description. <coughs> now, this process occurs whenever you have a central black hole and there is gas available to fall on it. Now, depending on the mass of the black hole, uh, some of this might also be visible in visible light. Okay, if you have a lot of gas falling on it. So the same uh, activity in the center of a galaxy around the black hole can either give rise to a lot of radio waves or give rise to a lot of uh, visible and ultraviolet light. In that case, it's called a quasar. Or it can also uh, give rise to both. So many quasars also emit radio waves. In fact, there's a very interesting, the very first quasar was first located at radio waves. And then when people found its position very accurately, they found that there is a mysterious optical object there. People have taken the spectrum of that object, but they didn't understand the spectrum at all. And the reason is, they assumed that it's a star in our own galaxy, and then the wavelengths did not agree with the wavelength of very known element. But the moment they realized that it's a very far away object, they could explain the spectrum completely, and that is the first quasar. So yes, uh, that's a brief introduction to quasars. Thank you, sir. The next is the last question of today's Q&A session, and it is from Master Varun K. Mukundan. And uh, I would prefer him to please come forward and ask your question yourself. Varun Atta, can you please come forward? Yes. Uh, thank you, you Varun. Uh. Uh, thank you for giving me a chance. Uh, so my question is, uh, two points are there. Uh, one is, uh, how can uh, radio astronomy, what's your comment on? Uh, how do radio astronomy take part in uh, search for extraterrestrial intelligence? I think uh, you have covered uh, that question in a few of other questions. And uh, one more question is the that uh, how uh, our India uh, how do we evaluate our India's performance in uh, SETI uh, by using this radio astronomy? Um, okay. Now, as I said, GMRT was built for other scientific objectives, but occasionally we have had users who wanted to use it for SETI. But I would say that another approach to SETI is to search for planets, whether there's life on them or not. And that kind of project has been uh, done at GMRT. So, uh, for example, a planet like Jupiter has a very strong magnetic field that emits radio waves. So, people have conducted searches using GMRT uh, looking for a similar object and in many cases now we know that there are hot uh, uh, planets like Jupiter around nearby stars and that was in fact the discovery of uh, uh, which won the Nobel Prize a couple of years ago. So once it is known that a certain number of stars have planets going around them which may or may not have life, people will turn radio telescopes on them to learn more and study the radio waves from them. So that is not exactly the search for SETI. See, SETI involves a huge, uh, okay, so let me tell you. If you take a television signal, for example, it occupies a fairly small bandwidth of few megahertz or your mobile phone signals. 
that is most radio astronomy signals occupy a very large range in wavelength so uh, for seti you have to build special receivers which will filter out everything else and look at a very narrow thing so uh, so so far uh, no most of the seti work has been done on telescopes that are dedicated for that purpose in a few cases like arecibo people have just put a seti re receiver on the telescope and uh, they don't care where it is pointed they will go on taking that signal and analyzing it. so i would say that in india it is not a major topic i mean professor sarup was interested in everything he was also interested in seti but uh, you know there are only so many things that one can do and he concentrated on the scientific uh, areas which i mentioned hmm? i hope varun that answers your question yes sir uh, thank you sir thank you for answering my question and uh, hmm. that's all uh, auto bharat hmm. thank you so much uh, varnata thank you so much rajaram nityananda sir hmm. for answering all our questions in fact it has been a pleasure to be uh, interacting with you for almost 15 20 minutes already uh, hmm. i hope almost all of the doubts have been cleared and what i uh, especially understand is that many of the participants are quite interested in extraterrestrial intelligence rather than uh, non living sources of radio astronomy which mm. seems a little bit obvious but i would like to di divert your interest in other fields and i hope uh, dr rajaram nityananda has been quite successful in that as well in fact uh, we have understood how important and how vast the field of radio astronomy is and uh, many of the participants Uh, have been inspired in taking up this particular field in their future so thank you so much sir thank you for answering all your questions all our questions and it has been a pleasure to be interacting with you uh, so over to thank you so much sir could i add something from my side huh? before first <laughs> yes. of all you know uh, i mean you have all been thanking me but uh, the thanks are also due in the reverse direction because one of our duties as people who have been supported by the government of india which means supported by the money of the indian people right uh, to do science <coughs> is to actually encourage uh, younger people so i have given uh, a huge number of talks in many places uh, all over the country and of course that has only increased after covid because now i don't have to travel so i would just like to leave the students uh, not that they have to do radio astronomy but in astronomy in general one of the uh, very good things is that there's a lot of cooperation so uh, you are not restricted to use only the telescope which is there in india you could use that telescope to find an interesting object if you need a bigger telescope to study it better you can write a proposal to that observatory and uh, many of my colleagues have done that right so for example uti radio telescope discovered an interesting object but they couldn't follow it up with uti they followed it up with other telescopes like vla and so on so astronomy in particular i would say is one area where there's a lot of cooperation uh not so much uh, competition right and uh, that makes working in astronomy interesting it also involves all branches of physics and technology and even computation so it's an interesting if, if you have the temperament i would encourage you to explore it a little more you still have many years uh, most of the audience you don't have to make any decision immediately but i would like to end by saying uh, you know i have to thank uh, the audience and the organizers as much as you have thanked me thank you so much sir thank you for those in inspiring mm -hmm. words and uh, you know as always i won't be i have not been able to ask all the questions so if there are any questions which have been left out we can always discuss them in our group whatsapp group cosmos and if there are any unanswered questions i believe dr rajaram nityananda will be there for us to clarify that as well and uh, the link for ul space quiz 22 which is based on a few things that we have learned today has been posted in the chat box and the quiz link will only be activated Uh, once the vote of thanks has been delivered so over to shajil sir for the rest of the proceedings thank you so much Th thank you varun uh, today we have a good good questions and sessions and i think uh, our students get more clarity on this radio astronomy and its uh, scope and uh, and it's a concluding session and we are we today we we concluded it well and uh, time was managed well and uh, the vote of thanks session was usually done by our t damodar sir he is uh, now he is not available uh, with us 
so i invite uh, yes i am with you yeah yes sir okay okay i couldn't see you that's why i i felt some trouble sir that that's thing yes, and yes. damar sir is the uh, the coordinator of work but on the edu project that's working under ulcs he was formerly he was an educational officer in the education department and now he is nurturing uh, a group of students uh, in the rural areas and they are here and uh, now we can proudly say that uh, these uh, group of students are uh, nourished by not by this ulcs and damar sir and uh, the whole time is all over india is showering the blessing and support to these uh, students and definitely we can say we are not believed in the number of participants in a in a program we are we are relying on the sincerity and the way they accept and they perform in these things so we are proud that all these students will go well and we want your support uh, especially from rajaram sir and the grand sir and we have jayaram generation sir is also with us in all programs patna minister is there and uh, before we uh, now we are on the concluding sessions i invite ajil mar ajil mar can i inter- interrupt for a interrupt interrupt yes, for a sir, moment yes, uh, yes. what about our next saturday program why don't you announce that okay sir uh, we want to hear from you sir <laughs> okay <laughs> <laughs> no you you can do it you can do it please please do it please do it okay uh, <clears throat> that the, the the topic is from the uh, data connectivity and data analysis and uh, that uh, especially the blockchain all these things and including the data uh, digital area that is done by dr lejish hod uh, university of calicut and he is a person from calicut also and he will make this wonderful session next week uh, on 24 uh, 24 of uh, this month that's information then damar sir okay thank you sir hi good afternoon everybody it's a pleasure for me to thank all the participants of this webinar 22nd webinar conducted by ul space club i think this might be a record to have conducted a series of 22 webinars in this pandemic period it is remarkable that all the past webinars including this today's one how blessed with the highly designated scientists and professors of and engineers of prestigious institutions of india today we have an eminent scientist dr rajaram jananda to place one more feather in the hat of ul space club our honorable guest has made an excellent excellent and informative speech about radio astronomy an indian success story this will bring the interest in radio astronomy and kindle the uh, curiosity of space study and career of our students on behalf of even cps foundation i am proud to extend our gratitude uh, to dr rajaram jananda for the elegant and beautiful talk on a very interesting topic thank you sir thank you once again i must thank the veterans participating in this webinar who always are with us i thank every well wishers who are cooperating with us then i thank all the participants of this webinar students parents teachers all of you who were who make our progress success i also thank sundarban after for sponsoring prizes to space quiz winners then i must thank the organizers of this program the chief mentor sri ek kutu sir uh, mod- uh, moderator sri shajil uk and student fellows of ul space club master varun master bharat master adil krishna master sri ram and uh, like that all are toiling for the good conducting of this webinar series thank you all once again thank you then let me stop thank you damar sir and for the for the information of the students the link for today's space quiz is posted in the comment box you can copy it and attempt it and that, that this uh, this uh, space quiz is sponsored by uh, center by nurture and uh, and continuously the students are guiding these things different parts of uh, this area okay
and now we made a wonderful conclusion of this uh, today's interesting topic and those who are having get the chance to uh, watch this directly these things are available readily available in the channel of ul space club and continuously a lot of people are watching in live streaming of ul space club now we have 22 uh, talks are there arranged in this ul space club channel and next week we are going to launch uh, by next week we are going to launch a, a website of this program uh, ul space club and we will make it a good ceremony uh, ceremony and we want uh, the support of all, from all your part and we expect it from you and so you I'm not going, okay. uh, one more point uh, that uh, i have posted the details of our whatsapp community in our guru uh, in our chat window we have whatsapp community called cosmos for new members to uh, your space club so uh, if anyone want to join uh, please uh, contact uh, in the uh, given numbers Thank you.